New Westminster Oral History Project. Today's date is December 17, 2001. The interviewee is Peter Larkin, who is with the British Columbia Dragoons, 9th Armored Division. So, Mr. Larkin, what is your full name? Full name is Peter John Larkin. And what's your date and place of birth? Well, I was born on uh, April 2nd, 1924 in Calgary, Alberta. Calgary, Alberta. Um, are you a married man? I'm a married man. <laughs> 56 years. And what would your wife's name and maiden name be? My wife's maiden name was Rose Stanfield. Okay. What about children? Uh, my wife and I have uh, four children, mm -hmm. a son and three daughters. Okay. And... Could you just tell, for the record, what their names and ages are? Well, Larry is our son. He was born in 1947. Uh, our eldest daughter is Linda, and she was born in 1950. Our next daughter is Barbara. She was born in 1952. And our youngest daughter is Mary, and she was born in 1954. All in New Westminster. All in New Westminster. Um, you mentioned you were born in Calgary. Where were your parents from? Actually, my parents were emigrating from uh, from uh, Great Britain. My father was a veteran of the First War. They were coming out here in 1924. And uh, my mother was expecting me at the time, and she didn't quite make it to B.C. She had, they had to take her off the train in Calgary long enough to have me. I was there or at least my mother and I were there in the hospital for, I believe, eight, eight or nine days, and following which my father, who had traveled on to the coast, came back and picked us up. So actually, while I was born in Alberta, all of my life has been in British Columbia except for eight or nine days in Calgary. So we really couldn't call you a prairie boy then? Well, I guess not. I guess not. <laughs> um... Okay, what is your current address? Current address is 25 Courtney Crescent, New Westminster, B.C. And what about other places of residences before this? Well, when my parents came to the coast, they lived in Port Hammond for a short while because my father's sister and her husband lived there, and my father got a job working in a, in a lumber mill in Port Hammond. However, he was, I guess... Uh, I understand he was a fairly accomplished uh, soccer player, and uh, New Westminster had a, a pretty good soccer team, I understand, in those early days, or at least around 1924-25. And uh, he got a job at the old Fraser Mills uh, in Coquitlam. Mm. I actually got a job there because uh, the manager of the New Westminster team was a foreman at the at that mill, and I guess they invited my father to come and play soccer with them. And oh. so we lived in Coquitlam until uh, I was uh, I joined up when I was 18, and they, we still lived in Coquitlam at that time. So my early schooling was in Coquitlam. However, uh, or all of my schooling was in Coquitlam. However, when I came back from overseas, my parents had moved to New Westminster. And uh, and I was then married uh, shortly after getting uh, back from overseas, well, about a year later. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I lived with uh, my parents for a short time until we built our own home. And this is the home here? No, we originally lived uh, in Lower Sapperton on Braid Street, where we built our first home. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in 1940. Seven, and we moved to our current address in 1968. Right. Okay. Good. So what branch of the armed forces were you enrolled in? Well, I joined the Army uh, when I was a short time prior to my 19th birthday, and uh, following uh, a basic and advanced training, I had uh, indicated uh, an interest in in joining the uh, a tank uh, regiment, or at least mm -hmm. going to the, the tanks, and uh, so consequently, I that's where I uh, I went, and that's where I ended with the tank regiment. Right. Okay. 
And what was your rank and position? My rank was a trooper, mm -hmm. which is the basic rank when you go into a tank regiment. And uh, my uh, actual qualifications, I was a, a gunner operator. In other words, I was trained to, to operate the uh, tank radio. I believe, if I recall, it was called the 19 set, and also to operate the, the uh, guns. And, and I, my position in the tank was a gu as gunner. Right, okay. So, oh, sorry. In the turret. turret. In the turret, yeah. Right, okay. Um, what was the date that you enrolled in the armed forces? I got enrolled on February 3rd, 1943, in Vancouver. In Vancouver, all right. And how did your family feel about that? Well, actually, I really wanted to get into the Air Force, and uh, I had gone to Vancouver. We had a bad snowstorm uh, in, in February 1943, or end of January, and I was working in, a, in, in Fraser Mills, actually, at Fraser Mills, and uh, they closed the mill down because of the heavy winter conditions, so I decided I would join the Air Force. I spent about, uh, well, actually a, a week uh, going over to Vancouver and being tested and writing exams, etc. However, following a, a week of that, uh, trying to uh, enroll in the Air Force, uh, on having gone from Monday to Friday of a particular week, uh, we were told that we were all accepted. However, they weren't going to be making a draft up uh, for a couple of months probably April. I was quite annoyed at that, having spent a whole week going over there, and I can recall walking out of the uh, Air Force uh, recruiting station and walking up Granville Street uh, late on a Friday afternoon, to, and I came to the old Vancouver Hotel and I saw the big sign, which was uh, a recruitment center for, uh, for the Army, and I walked in and uh, that I was there to join the army. Unfortunately, I walked into the, the division that we were hiring women, and they had <laughs> quite a laugh over that. Sent me to the right place, and, and uh, in a few minutes, I was basically in the army. Wow! Wow! Um, so, how old were you then when you? Were well, I was almost uh, 19. I, uh, I, my birthday is April. Yeah. And this was February, so I was just a couple of okay. months or so off my 19th birthday. And and how, was your family fine with this? Well, I remember phoning them after I joined up, and uh, I think they were a little bit uh, surprised that uh, that I'd done that. But although I think my dad was quite well, probably proud because he'd served in the. Mm. In the British Army, and he had joined up when he was 16, although he lied to get in. But right. Anyway. Right. No, uh, I think they took it uh, okay. Right. And, and when you enrolled, did you enroll with some buddies or friends? Or well, actually, no. I was all by myself. I walked into this particular, uh, as I said, into the mm -hmm. recruiting station, and there was one other fellow sitting there, a little short fellow, who I didn't know at all. There was no one else in there. It was almost closing time. Mm. And uh, turned out he lived in in North Burnaby, is in uh, Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Bill McMurray, and we became pretty good buddies. Actually, mm. uh, we went through uh, basic training together in Vernon, and uh, at the end of that period, he went into the infantry. So he was off to an advanced training in, uh, I believe, in uh, Edmonton or Calgary. Mm. Uh, I had met his family while we were at Little Mountain in Vancouver, because when we first joined up, we spent about two weeks in Little Mountain getting equipment and being indoctrinated into the Army, and uh, uh, mm. I never saw him again. Oh, really, eh? <clears throat> Actually, he was killed. He was, eh? Yeah. yeah. He was with the Royal Edmonton Regiment. I believe he was killed in North Europe. Right. So tell me, um, in the end, how many years of service did you complete? Well, actually, I went in in 43, and I got out in uh, July 
45. Right. I was still in the hospital uh, after I was wounded. And I was wounded in Italy, and I went to Great Britain or England. I was in England a short time receiving some uh, basic uh, treatment so I could travel. Mm -hmm. And I was brought back to Canada and uh, uh, went from Vancouver to Toronto for some, uh, for about a year and a half for some plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and during that time, I met my my wife, right. the lady who was going to be my wife, and uh, we were going to get married, but uh, I got I got out of the army while I was in the hospital, and I became uh, un I came under DVA, but uh, I wasn't in the service. So my service was from February '43 to July '46. '46. Okay. Before we get into th talking about that a little bit, why don't we talk a bit about um, how, how did you feel when you heard that Canada declared war on Germany? Well, I was uh, I was still in school, of course, in 1939, junior high school, and uh, I don't I don't know that all of my friends and myself thought too much about it. We just you know we were pretty young, however. It wasn't long before we started to realize that uh, that uh, when when some of our older friends were joining up and going away, uh, because in those years, 1939, there'd been a depression, of course, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of unemployed young men, and they went into the services like the army, because uh, a lot of them it meant they got three square meals a day, and even though they I think most of them probably did it for patriotic reasons. However, I guess uh, some of them had a better life once they got in the army than they had during the Depression years. However, yeah. uh, once in 39, 40, 41, the war got going very well. Then, of course, when when we saw all our friends joining up that were a little bit older than us, uh, we all, uh, I know I wanted to join up as soon mm -hmm. as I could. and. Uh, I guess uh, we just wondered what it was all about. We soon right. found out. Yeah, no kidding, hey. Um, you, you told me a bit about your your basic and advanced training. Tell me a little bit about tank training. Well, when you have basic training, is you learn how to use a rifle and and uh, grenades and, and machine guns. Mm -hmm. However, when you get into tank training. You're, you're part of a crew. Okay. So a tank crew is made up, uh, if you like a team, we call them a crew. Uh, and you have five, five people that man a tank, a driver and a co-driver down in the front and a, a loader. They call them a loader operator because he also had to be able to, to operate the radio. And, but basically the loader operator, uh, put the shells into the, the large gun in the turret, mm. and uh, of course the gunner, which was myself, and a crew commander. So you were you trained to work together, mm -hmm. and uh, of course a lot of the training was was gunnery training, so uh, you could hit something when the time came. Right. Uh, much different than uh, than uh, say infantry training, although we had to do. We'd go for a mile run every morning, about 6.30 or so. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we, we did a lot of radio uh, learning to Morse code, etc. Mm -hmm. Learning how to operate the radio and uh, also gunnery. Most of, mostly that, that was our Mostly training. gunnery. What about things like, I mean, if you have five people, you'd have to learn how to coordinate well, all sorts right. of things, hey? Eh? Yeah. The, co-driver or the driver and the co-driver of course they were more interested or uh, they worked together as far as maintaining what they had to do in, in, in as far as the motors and the tank and so on uh the right the turret crew which was the crew commander and the gunner being myself and the loader we had to to be familiar with what had to happen in in the turret when we when you first get a tank, I know the first tank we got, uh, the tank we were hit in, uh, had you know it had to be prepared for for 
to be used, so all the guns come with uh, oil on them and grease. We had to clean them, prepare all the guns. That was my job, to look after the guns, make sure they were, they were operating. And of course, the co-driver or the gunner operator assisted me. Mm -hmm. We had to uh, zero in the guns so they were accurate. Right. And uh, so basically, we worked together as a team, and we did for several weeks before we went into action. Right. Okay. Um, describe to me a little bit about your journey across the Atlantic. Well, that's uh, that uh, is kind of interesting because I, when I was training in uh, Camp Borden, uh, it was summertime, forty in forty three, mm -hmm. and uh, Ontario can be pretty darn hot. Riding around in the tank uh, was darn hot. And uh, on different occasions, I'd look across and see guys training to be dispatch riders, motorcycle dispatch riders. And right. They were whizzing along over the sand dunes, etc. And uh, it looked pretty cool to me. So I thought, gee, I wouldn't mind transferring and to that uh, and being maybe tra training to be a dispatch rider. So I, I uh, paraded, got paraded to the CO and and uh, made the request, and the CO was pretty pretty good about it, except he said, while well, I was in the midst of training, of a course, a gunnery course, that probably I should complete that and, and come and see him when, uh, when he got done. Well, when I got done, uh, which was at the end of August 43, uh, I was told that I could go come back to BC on a on a month's end embarkation leave to go right. overseas. So I didn't want to miss that. So I never did uh, transfer to the to be a DR dispatch rider, and I'm pretty glad I didn't because when those fellows got over to Great Britain and were riding around in the night in the blackout, uh, escorting uh, convoys of of uh, vehicles. Right. A number of them uh, ran into brick walls and so on and got pretty badly hurt, so. <clears throat> I bet it couldn't on a motorcycle at war. <laughs> no. Anyway, I came home on embarkation and even went back, and we went from Camp Borden, Ontario, to uh, Halifax, where we boarded uh, uh, a ship called the Aquitania. And the Aquitania was a four-funnel... Uh, uh, passenger liner prior to the war. It uh, carried passengers uh, across the oceans. It was converted to, to a troop carrier, and it was the last of the four final uh, British ships. The Lusitania mm. uh, was one, I believe, that was sunk. And we went out of Halifax unescorted across the Atlantic in uh, six days, I think it was, to uh, Greenwich, Scotland. But strangely enough, when I, as I was boarding the troop ship in Halifax, uh, we were all carrying our gear and going on board this ship. And once we got on board, we were being shown to where we were going to be. Uh, we could put our gear and sleep. Uh, I heard a voice holler at me, and I looked across uh, another across the stairway, the downstairs we were going upstairs on one side of this area mm -hmm. and here was a fella from new westminster a real good friend of mine who was in the navy and he was going overseas unbeknownst to either of us because uh, we hadn't seen each other for a while uh he was going over in a draft not on a navy ship but on a troop ship so oh. we spent our time together although he was navy he's from new westminster so uh, well, that was kind of a a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah. So we landed in Greenwich, Scotland, where uh, we went from Greenwich down to uh, Aldershot. Okay, and, and is that's it, where I did. We were. I was in Aldershot until until I went to Italy. Right, and so you were there for about a year, I'd imagine. No, I was so? got into. Uh, we went overseas in, uh, as I recall. Uh, October 43, and uh, I was in uh, Aldershot to, I believe, sometime late January 44, 
we went to Italy. Right, okay. Oh, so you didn't do a lot of training there then? Not no. very much training in Great Britain, no. Did you ever go on leave while you were there? Oh, yes, I went on leave to... Uh, see, my mother and father, as I mentioned earlier, came out from England, and I had... Yeah. My dad had a brother uh, and, a, and a sister living in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, sister lived right in London, and I visited uh, her uh, several times. Uh, during the Blitz, mm -hmm. uh, and also visited my uncle who lived in Reading, he and his wife. So I did get around a little bit, but not an awful lot, not as much as uh, right. if had I been there probably seven or eight or nine months, I'd have probably got around much more. Probably, yeah. yeah. But, uh, no. D describe to me um, just just a, a regular or average day in, in England. Well, we it was a uh, we were in the uh, Aldershot. We were in the Aldershot barracks or camp was right in in town. It would be like a camp being on Columbia Street at the foot of Sixth Street in New Westminster, oh, okay. right in the center of a town. And we were, and it was uh, uh, as far as I can recall, Aldershot, as far as I know, was a uh, always a military uh, town over right. the years. Right. And the barracks we were in were called the Warburg Barracks. And actually the first, they were brick buildings, two-story. Mm -hmm. And the first story or ground floor uh, at one time was where they kept their horses. The, the, oh, okay. the soldiers in those days slept upstairs and the horses were, were stabled under and we, uh, the lower floor was used for barracks for men when we were there, but we happened to be on the second floor. And uh, I can always recall them being very cold. With the, we, the rooms we were in had probably 20 or 30 fellows and, and with a little wee, tiny, narrow, coal-fired fireplace. Mm. That was the heat. But mm. basically, because we were uh, training, we would we would get up in the morning and uh, and, and go for breakfast as, as you would uh, normally, and then our days were spent. Now you you have to re realize that that was winter. Mm -hmm. British winters were cold or dreary and lots of fog, and uh, uh, we would either go for uh, uh, wireless training, sitting in a room uh, uh, doing. Uh, Morse code, etc., etc., or we would be out in the tanks, and we would go uh, a place called Beachy Head, which is on the east coast of, of England. There was a firing range there, and we uh, we went there several times, uh, a practice range. Right. But okay. uh, because I was only in England for a, for a short time. As I said, I didn't travel around much, but our days were pretty well filled with that kind of training. Right, right. And uh, we had other things we had to do. There was fire picket, mm -hmm. where you were supposed to be on duty maybe over on, on like a Saturday night, and you were watching for uh, if any bombers came over, and there was, there was fire, what they call fire picket. And I can always remember one incident uh, where... Uh, it was my first leave in Great Britain, and I was going to go to London to see my dad's sister, and uh, I had made arrangements by telephoning her that when I got off duty on this particular Saturday, we used to parade on Saturday morning till noon, right. and then we were free, and uh, you could apply for a pass to go somewhere, and I'd applied for a pass. and. Uh, so all these arrangements were on, and I can remember my aunt was going to meet me in Waterloo Station. Of course, I had never met her. And uh, so I said, well, how will I recognize you? She said, well, I'll be carrying, I'll be wearing a black coat, and I'll be carrying a newspaper under my arm. Well, when I got to Waterloo Station, and there was hundreds of people walking around with <laughs> newspapers. However, we did meet, but prior to that, we paraded till noon, and as we broke off, the sergeant major read out the fire picket list for that weekend, and my name was on it. I had been on fire picket the previous week. Well, of course, I, I wondered, good heavens, what am I going to do? 
uh, my aunt will be going up to meet me, and I don't know whether I can get a hold of her to, you know, to tell her I'm not going to be there. So I've, I went up to the sergeant major and, and asked to speak to him and explained that I had a path and uh, I was due to go to London that for the weekend, that I'd been on fire picket the week before. And he very pointedly told me that there was a, quote, bloody war on, and uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, regardless of what had happened the previous week, that I was on fire picket. Well, I went back to my quarters, and I thought about it for a while, and I guess I got a little annoyed. And when you're in this army, there's a, there's a rules, and it's called K.R. Can, and and it gives it outlines what what a soldier can and can't do. And one of the things you can do is you can ask to be paraded to the CO if you have a problem. So I thought, well, I'm going to do something about this. So I went up to the orderly room, and when I walked in, the sergeant major was there, and a sergeant and a corporal. And I asked to see the sergeant major, and he came forward. And I identified myself and said that I request permission to be paraded before the CO because, and I went over what had happened. There was dead silence for about a half a minute or so. He just looked at me and uh, he turned to the sergeant and said, you sure this man has passed? Good so he, he backed down. All right. I, I figured he was sure going to be after me after that, but... Uh, Nothing really happened uh, a short time after I went to Italy anyway. But. Right. Describe to me about, describe to me Italy. Well, mm -hmm. Italy, we, we went on a, we went from Aldershot to Greenwich, Scotland, where we boarded a, a, a ship to go in the convoy. Of course, we didn't know exactly what was happening. It's all mm -hmm. new to us. Mm -hmm. However, we were in a convoy that went from Greenwich, Scotland, to Italy, mm -hmm. and the ship that we happened to be on was called the Leopoldville, and it was a Belgium Congo uh, tub, <laughs> a rusty old tub, and we were crammed in there. Uh, I can recall when we boarded the ship, we noticed that there was some troops coming off of it at a further end of the ship. It turned out that, that they were Seaforth uh, uh, Highlanders? Highlanders. Right. Uh, and it turned out that actually they were walking off the ship as we were told because they were, pro they'd been on for a few days. They were protesting the poor food and the, the food being prepared for them, as I understand it, was being prepared by Belgian Congo crew people. And of course they, I guess, were not good at preparing the food that uh, the type of food Canadians were used to eating. Uh, the outcome of that was that Army Service Corps cooks were brought on board. Right. And these guys came back on. So we went in a convoy from Greenwich to Naples and it took us 14 days. Whoa. Very, very slow because the speed of the convoy is governed by the slowest ship in the convoy. So. We were quite some time getting to Italy, and uh, once we got into the Mediterranean, I recall, there was a real bad storm, and uh, we got tossed around pretty good. And I can recall, you know, you'd be on the ship, ours wasn't a very big ship, and we'd go down in the trough, and you'd look and up, and the waves would be above you, and, the, no and then up we'd come. And down we'd go. But anyway, we arrived in Naples, and, you know, we were expecting, at least I was expecting, that we would pull up to a dock. But as we pulled into Naples Harbor, uh, it was a beautiful, sunshiny day, and uh, uh, you could see all these beautiful buildings, mm -hmm. and the sun was shining on them. And we were taken off by a smaller, smaller boats because you couldn't dock. The, the docks were all damaged from bombing oh. that. And we, but when we arrived ashore, much to my surprise, most of these buildings, all we were looking at was outer shells, you know. They'd been bombed, a lot of them. And, it was uh, pretty much a wrecked city. And I can recall, we, we had to march from the ship 
or from the, where we went ashore to a railway station. And out of all these ruins would come kids and, and people with, you know, with their hands out uh, wanting something. And uh, every soldier carried a uh, chocolate. This chocolate was supposed to, you weren't supposed to eat it. It was supposed to be, the only time you could eat this stuff is, is whether is when you were given an order that go ahead and you can eat it. And of course, some of us gave this chocolate away and uh, <coughs> we, excuse me, we, got, we got heck for that. But we went from Naples to Avellino, mm -hmm. which was a small town, uh, and we were in, a, in a, <coughs> an Italian hospital that had been under construction. And of course, construction ceased <laughs> because of the war. Right. So we were housed in there with many other people, soldiers. We slept right on the marble floor. No, there were some areas that had bunks, but where we were, we we just lay, laid a ground a ground sheet down on the on the floor, mm -hmm. and uh, you had a blanket. That's what we slept on, and. In the morning when you woke up, most of us were all white, covered from the fine dust that had been stirred up, you know, during the day. Oh, yeah. And then it all settled on you. There was no power. Uh, I can recall we used to make a little lamp out of a, out of a, we used to get our cigarette, British cigarettes you got in a round tin, mm -hmm. capstan cigarettes, I think they were called. So we'd cut a piece of cord off our duffel bag and then soak it in kerosene, put some kerosene in the tin and a hole in the lid and pull the cord up like a wick and that's the light we had. Oh, and, inventive. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we were there, that's where I was until there for several weeks until we were moved up and joined the regiment. As I was in, in, in this particular camp was, we were, uh, a replacement squadron camp. Yeah. yeah. So when the regiment, like for instance, I went to the VCDs, they needed one, two, or three tanks, whatever. Then you were brought forward, and uh, right. So that's that's how it happened. Yeah. Um, explain to me a little bit. Uh, describe quickly the uniform and supplies you would have carried with you during combat. Well, you had. Uh, you had your duff you had your kit with you and uh so therefore you had your uniform but the the daily uniform uh, uh at that particular time of the year and now i'm talking about just before we went into action we wore uh shorts mm -hmm. and uh, putties boots shirt uh tam tank tam and uh we did carry uh coveralls mm -hmm. And uh, that was basically our, our, our outfit in good weather. And other, otherwise, we, we had a normal army uniform. Right. Uh, we carried uh, uh, Army Service Corps cooks traveled close with you. And they set up like a, a tent for, uh, for feeding you. But when you were out in the field, you had the uh, hard tack. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just heated up some hot water or tea. Uh, we slept when we were in the field and moving. You either slept, most of the time you slept outside under a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd put up a, a mosquito netting from a branch and tuck it around your uh, ground sheet and climb in and, and, and you slept with your clothes on. Now some fellows early in the war, uh, when they were on skeins and that in Great Britain, uh, would sleep under the tank, like right. just get under the tank. Well, they, I understand it never happened to us, but in some of the soft ground, the tank settled. These guys got crushed. No. So yeah. they, 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 of course, dug a slit trench, some of them, and uh, had tank crews, and they would go in the slit trench, but they would drive the tank over. But right. that didn't work so good because it's true. Uh, if they were under attack, in some cases, the tanks were hit and the gasoline went down into the slit trenches. So basically, 
the only time uh, I either slept outside, which was most of the time, or on, a, on one, or, one or two occasions I slept inside the tank, but it was very cramped. You'd be right. basically uh, sitting in your gunner's seat, so right. Uh, right. you slept outside. What about mail service? We got mail, very little mail. It would catch up to you. Right. Uh, you'd get a bundle of letters, maybe after two or three weeks or a month, you'd get two or three letters or something. Right. In a camp, like Aldershot, you'd get your mail. The mail would come there eventually, but when we were moving... Uh, we didn't get mail that, that often. No. And I can recall the, the day before we were hit, uh, we were issued, uh, er, occasionally we would be issued uh, a ration of beer, we'll say. Okay. And uh, maybe you got the, a bottle of beer a week or a couple of bottles or whatever they felt they were going to give you, I guess. I, I never knew too much about that, but I can remember one time we all got about three big bottle, quart bottles of beer that, that was a ration from, you know, catching up to us. Oh, I see. Right. But uh, I can recall the day before we were hit, our sergeant come, came and he had a bottle of gin. And uh, he waved it to us and he said, we've been given this. So we, he put it in the tank. We will use that when we need it. And the morning that we went into action, I can recall... They passed this bottle of gin around, and we all had a swig. I, I didn't care much for gin, and and so a little bit was used out of it. And I'd also received 300 Winchester cigarettes two days before we got hit, and they were in the tank. And you know, that's one of the things I thought of when I woke up in the hospital. All the cigarettes are gone. <laughs> <laughs> Good cigarettes. Anyway, <laughs> so you weren't in action long then. No, so very first action. Uh, we uh, we were called forward and we traveled all night and uh, uh, arrived at the Melfa River in in uh, in Italy, which is uh, below Rome, south of Rome, not too far from Monte Cassino. Mm -hmm. And we pulled into uh, they call it a tank harbor. These were all where the tanks were gathered and lots of troops. The road was just clogged with with vehicles and tanks and uh, uh, on our radio we were told to uh, follow this line of tanks and it happened to be C squadron of the BCDs mm -hmm. uh, and we were given the radio frequency and uh, the next thing you know we were crossing the Melfa River and we were into action and it was over very very quickly for us. Right. So, um before you talk about that, this this crew that you were with, would it have been the same crew that you trained with in Canada? No, no. No, it was all different? No, or? we we came together as a crew in Avellino when we got to Naples. Oh, okay. So uh, we were... went to this uh, uh, camp called in Avellino, and uh, there we, we, we got a tank. Mm -hmm. After being there a few weeks, we got a tank, oh, which was like, you know, our tank. Right. And we had to prepare it, as I say, clean the guns, right. and, and uh, there we trained as a crew. But uh, right, okay. We weren't training as a crew that that long before we went into action. Actually, uh, I can't even remember the name of the driver and the co-driver of the loader. The loader's last name was Smith, but I cannot remember his first name, and uh, that doesn't mean that. That you know, I should remember it really, but I, I just don't. The the, only, the guy I remember well, of course, was uh, uh, our crew commander uh, Ed Singdale. He was from uh, uh, he was a sergeant from uh, Vernon, and uh, I have a book here. It's a history of the BCDs called Sinews of Steel, and there is a, a section in there where I. I, could, I read about our battle where, where right. we were hit. He's mentioned because he was uh, he was uh, he's mentioned as uh, as commander of one of the tank tanks that was hit. Right. And in the back of the book, it lists all all of their casualties, dead and wounded. And my name is amongst them. But of course, because we joined our crew, joined the regiment that morning, we didn't know anybody. You never knew anyone. No, right. never, and of course. 
The B BCDs have a reunion every every year in Vernon or Kelowna. Uh, they're actually the BCDs are were formed. They're an interior tank regiment that were made most up mostly of fellows from Vernon, Kelowna, and Penticton. Okay. And but of course, also this was when they were first formed, but. Uh, predominantly, that's that were they were made up of people from those areas, but of course later from all over the like BC and when I get there, I get their newsletter and there's guys from all over Canada along for that. Yeah, yeah. But I never go because you know I don't know anybody. Right. Yeah, you just met them. You know, right. and uh, that's not the only reason I have never gone. I'm involved in the city and have been for instance, with Mayday, and that's that's when they have their reunions. So right. it just never worked out for me to go, but I've never, I, I, I'm a lifetime member of the regiment, BCD, because I've, I've they offered, uh, you know, you could give them a donation of a hundred bucks or something, and uh, that made you a lifetime member, but I would be a member anyway, it wouldn't matter. Right. That was just to support them. So, so tell me a bit about um, what happened that day you went into action. Well, we got orders. We were we were uh, harbored in a field south of the uh, Melford River uh, the day before we went into action, and that was the 24th of uh, of May 1944, and we were doing some training mm -hmm. and. The next thing we knew, we were we were called to have a medical, and we had a medical right out in the field, like right at standing in the field. Doctors checked us all over, and said we were we were moving up. We got orders that we were moving up to the front. So we took off with a couple of other tanks in in a in a convoy, if you like, and we traveled the rest of that day and overnight. Mm. Uh, and arrived at the, the, say, the, the Melfa River on early in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, on a bright, sum, uh, sunny day. And then we were given the orders to follow those tanks. And we could hear on our radio, uh, whoever was directing it, you know, the tanks on the left, watch out for the far corner of that field, etc., etc. Oh, wow. And uh, we crossed this river. Now this is like going down a, a river bank and across a stretch of water which was maybe 30 or 40 feet across. And uh, it was not deep, it's not like crossing the Fraser River. Right. Uh, the battle there had commenced a couple of days or a day before and it would involve the Westminster Regiment and I think I told you that before. That's where Maho Mahoney Vic Mahoney won the VC with the, right. with the Westminster Regiment. Uh, we were in support along with the Irish Regiment of Canada, Tank Regiment of Canada, as far as I know. And I learned this later. All we knew, we were to follow these tanks and cross this river. And once we came up the other the side of the river, we passed a burnt out German scout car with a couple of guys laying beside it. Obviously they were dead. And we came up into a wheat field. Uh, it wasn't high wheat, but probably maybe two or three feet high of wheat, but it was a field. Right. And tanks were on our left and tanks were on our right, and we were proceeding forward. And there was a lot of radio chatter, you know, be careful, watch for this, watch for that. And uh, the next thing I uh, saw was a flash. It was daylight, but I saw a flash to my right because I'm looking through a periscope. Right. Uh, and the next thing, we were hit. The tank was ajar, and I told the crew commander that I saw a flash on our right from a farmhouse. So, being the gunner, I got the order to traverse right, which meant that I had to, to turn the turret so our gun could line up on this uh, farmhouse. And we we hit the farmhouse. We didn't hit it. And what you, what you're taught to do is you bracket a target. In other words, you'll fire a shot at an estimated number of yards, 
and you can see where it hits. If mm -hmm. it if it hits in front of it, you haven't you haven't you haven't got the enough elevation. So you and and if you hit over it, then you know in between is your target. But we we did hit the farmhouse and and blew it up. In the meantime, we were hit. The first uh, shell that hit us, as far as we knew, was, was in the motor, mm -hmm. the rear of the tank. So we were unable to move, but we still had power to traverse the turret left or right or up and down. And uh, the gun. Uh, so while we were hitting this farmhouse, we were hit two more times. So we were hit three times. Right. Usually, you don't survive that because if if a shell hits you in the turret, and and we were being hit by a German 88 anti-tank gun, mm -hmm. which are very very good guns, and a shell would penetrate the turret and and go around in in the turret would probably kill all the crew. Right. Anyway, after the third hit, I was unable to use to maneuver the turret at all. Mm -hmm. So I advised the crew commander of this and we got the order to abandon tank. That meant that rather than go out of the top of the tank where we would be silhouetted, we go we would go out through the bottom of the tank, which down in the driver's compartment there was an uh, uh, an opening that you could go through and crawl out under the tank, which you right. had enough space. So the driver and the co-driver did this. Okay. The loader, because you had to, yeah. Fortunately, we were able to get through from the turret down into the driver's compartment because there is space. There are spaces in the turret that line up that, that offers you a passageway. Fortunately, before the turret got jammed, we were able to. They would be able to go down there. So the loader followed the driver and the co-driver, he started to go down through into the driving compartment to go out. And right behind him was the sergeant, was the crew commander. Mm -hmm. And because only because of his, I was on the right side of the turret and the escape route was on the left side. So the crew commander, the loader was right opposite the escape route, the way he went, and the tank commander was took his position basically in the center of the turret. Mm -hmm. He followed, or went to follow, and I would have been the next guy. Right. So I would have been the last guy out. Right. Uh, as it was, we were hit a fourth time. And the fourth time, as far as it could be determined, the tracer on the back of the shell that hit us ignited some cordite from a couple of broken shells that the loader in, in ramming rounds into the big gun sometimes he's the rounds he either dropped it or or somehow that the casing came apart and the cordite right. got on the floor of the tank so this ignited the, this is why we had such a hot hot fire in the flame inside the tank well as soon as as soon as that you know it was just a flash of flame it was just mm -hmm. fire all over the place and of course, I was, I was on the right side of the big gun that juts into this space. I had to come around it and go out the escape hatch. Or well, right above me was the turret, uh, the open turret, and that's the way I went. That's the way you went. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, just as an aside to all of this, uh, when we went into action that morning, it was a hot um, morning. You know, the sun was up; it was quite warm. And we got orders to put on coveralls. We'd been wearing shorts, and uh, so we all put on coveralls, except the crew commander. He didn't put coveralls on. So consequently, when I was on fire, the coveralls protected me to a certain degree, so the burns I received were to my hands and my face. Uh, but I want to just go back to an incident that happened just as we were going into action. Uh, our sergeant was quite short, and the gunner's seat in the tank is concave. The back of it, 
the back there's a part that that is detachable from the seat the back part is concave mm -hmm. and you can buckle yourself in and, and it, it stops you from bouncing around mm -hmm. he asked me if if I could do without this because he wanted to put the seat on the the back of the seat on the floor of the tank and being that it was concave he could stand on it and his eye sight would he could just look out the open turret right. without standing on the platform and being free or half exposed he was now able to see but without exposing himself right. uh, so we did that however I've often thought of this, had that not occurred, I probably wouldn't have got out of the tank because I would, I would have, whether I would have had enough time to unbuckle the safety and get out of this, mm -hmm. uh, because it sort of confines you, I don't know. Mm. Anyway, I came out the top and, and just dove from the top of the turret into the wheat, onto the ground, and, and then I turned and looked, I rolled to put the flame out in my, that was on my body and uh, I can recall I looked across and there was some there was a soldier down in the wheat and uh, he was looking forward and I called to him and I said uh, have I got a nose because I felt like I'd, 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 I'd lost some of my face like and he said oh you're going to be okay just just keep down, and I think, I don't know, but I think to this day that he was a member of the Westminster Regiment. Right. An infantry. Now, when I look back at the tank, the, uh, the crew commander, instead of continuing down, following the loader out of the tank, he obviously reversed himself and went to go out of the tank top of the turret. I'd already gone. Mm. He was hanging half in the tank and half out, obviously unconscious. And because of the fact that the uh, escape hatch in the bottom of the tank was open and the turret was open, there would be a draft of air and the flames were coming out and he got quite severely burned uh, in the lower part of his body. In fact, he, uh, he lived, he lived uh, long enough to get back to Canada, but he didn't. He, he, he didn't survive. Right, right, right. The uh, as far as I know, I, I looked up and I looked at my hands. The skin, <coughs> skin of my hands were hanging way down, and uh, but before I could have even got up on the tank, uh, the loader and the the co-driver and the driver got up and pulled him out. Right. They got him out of the tank. But uh, then they went one way with him into the wheat, and we were in the, laying in the wheat, and what uh, I happened to be next to the, the loader, and our fear was that tanks coming behind us wouldn't see us in the, in the wheat and would run over us. So we got up and ran for a little farmhouse that was on the banks of the river that we'd pass when we came up, when we crossed the river. And we got behind a wall of a, this uh, farmhouse, little farmhouse, and uh, we just sat on the ground, he and I, and with our backs against the wall. And, but there was a lot, a lot of shelling going on, and you could hear, you could hear the whistle of the shell, you know, you could hear the, mm -hmm. and next thing we knew there was an explosion. And we, we felt the walls shake, so we thought we better try and get back down towards the river, which we started to do. And the next thing you know, I recall, uh, two guys come up to us and they were yelling, stretcher bearers, stretcher bearers. And uh, there was no stretcher bearers, so one, by this time, I was starting not be able to see. Right. So one, one guy had me by the arm, and we waded across the river, and I can recall feeling the water about up to my knees or so, and uh, wondering whether we were going to go deeper or what. But anyway, we got across the river, and then I recall, by this time I couldn't see, and I recall hearing uh, stretcher bears, and next thing you know, 
I was being laid on a stretcher and I could smell this uh, like burning and it was my hair. You know how your hair yeah. sticks. And, yeah. uh, so they took us, <coughs> <coughs> took uh, me to, uh, turned out it was, <laughs> as I found out listening, we were in a, <coughs> a basement of an Italian farmhouse where there was a field dressing station. Mm. And uh, by then, we were, I was starting to feel pain, and uh, I just felt them, I could feel something cold going up the side of my legs, and, and I heard them say, uh, we're just taking off your uniform, and they just cut your uniform off with a pair of scissors, and, and, uh, right. and I felt them, they gave me a shot of morphine, I guess, in the arm, and the next thing I know, I was, you know, pretty well out of it. Yeah. And I woke up. I seemed to come to several times uh, with a very, very, all I really wanted to do was drink. Well, it turned out I just inhaled smoke and flame, and the inside of my mouth was all burnt. Right. And uh, so, of course, I was real dry. Right. And uh, they would give me some liquid, and uh, I ended up from there. I can, I can just recall somebody examining my eyes and, and saying they thought I would be okay. Uh, then my face was completely covered with, with uh, bandages and uh, felt like wet. Uh, it turns out it's saline solution that's to, mm. to uh, treat you, I guess you'd call it. And uh, I woke up in a hospital in the 14th Canadian General in Caserta. And then, you and then I was, I was there from May the 25th or so until I went to Great Britain on a hospital ship in July. But uh, for about two weeks, the first two weeks, I didn't know whether I could see or not. That that was the thing that worried me more than anything, mm. because every day they would change your 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 dressings in your face, and they would use uh, some ointment or something they just prepared and put it right over your face completely right and uh, it was about two weeks before uh, they got it so that I, I could get my eye open then I could see I felt better but a funny incident and I've told this story many times when I was first burnt a short time after uh, I couldn't of course see and uh, one day a doctor was with me and uh, he he said would you like me to write a letter home to your parents so i i agreed to that and he you know wrote a letter i don't know exactly what he said in it but that, that uh, uh, i found out later i guess he basically said i was fine and so on and so forth well about three weeks or a month after that he came into the ward. By this time, I, I was able to see. I was still, you know, was, one eye was covered. And I needed some work on my eyelids. He came into the ward with a great big grin on his face. And he come up to me and he said, guess what I got today? I said, no, I don't know what you got today. He said, I got a, pa a package from your mother because you've written a letter home. Right. He said, he said she thought she must have thought that I was a woman because he'd signed his name, you know, Captain whatever. But, of course, my mother thought it was a nurse. So my mother had sent him six pairs of nylon stockings, women's <laughs> stockings. So he was waving. These are very... He said he'd get a date that night. I'm sure. <laughs> Everybody howled about that. So so do you feel there that the hospitals treated you well then? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And I guess you would have taken a hospital ship back to Canada too, right? Yeah, we went by hospital ship from Italy to England. In England, I they only they only operated on me long enough to uh, the doctor that examined me happened to be the head plastic surgeon for the Canadian Army, mm. and he said that they would uh, make me more comfortable by fixing. Uh, uh, around my eyes so I could uh, travel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they took some skin from behind my ears and fixed up my eyelids somewhat 
-hmm. And uh, he said, you're going back to Canada. So uh, I just hung around Great Britain in the hospital for about a month. And uh, I was on a hospital ship back to, to Halifax. Mm -hmm. And it came from Halifax, of course, right through to Vancouver on a hospital train. Mm -hmm. Arrived in Vancouver and was sent to Shaughnessy Hospital. Uh, arrived on a Saturday morning, and uh, my parents were had been notified by the Red Cross that I was coming in, and they met me and uh, my sister and a good buddy of mine in the other.